All right, um, let's start looking at um, <clears throat> ancient Egyptian architecture. Uh, <clears throat> in Egypt, architecture is constructed um, in using a different material in comparison to Mesopotamia we looked at so far. So <clears throat> Mesopotamian architecture uh, except for, you know, the, uh, the Persian, the Persian are not quote unquote Mesopotamian, but Mesopotamian architecture use primarily earth, right? They use dried, you know, um, clay brick um, and use tile um, for surface decoration. So it's basically use clay, uh, manipulate the clay into Adobe and use Adobe to construct the wall and, and platform and um, um, use the, um, the burned um, clay uh, to create um, bricks, uh, tiles to um, put decoration on the surface. But Egyptian architecture, the monumental buildings and the monuments were constructed in stone. So here we see the first kind of stone architecture that is not monolithic. Um, these stones are quarried into um, blocks and using stone blocks for the construction of pyramid, of temple, uh, etc. So we are looking at a architectural tradition utilizing an entirely different material compared to the previous Mesopotamian architecture. Um, I think that's the first thing we need to uh, be aware um, when looking at Egyptian monuments. Um, <clears throat> like Mesopotamia, Egyptian civilization was also cradled by a great river. And in this case, it is just one river. And that's the river Nile. The Nile River, um, with, is very important for Egyptian civilization. Um, its significance to the Egyptian world can be compared to the sun and the moon in the sky, right? So in the sky, there's a sun in the daytime and the moon at night and on the land, it is the mighty Nile River. The Nile River, um, a linear element on Earth, runs from south to north, uh, while the sun and the moon cross the sky from east to west. All right, so the Nile and the heavenly body helped to define the Egyptian sense of orientation, direction, and these orientations and directions had a symbolic religious um, significance. Um, <clears throat> the sun rises from the east and dies from uh, in the west. So the east is the direction of life, and the west is the direction of death. And uh, in the Old Kingdom, all the living cities are located on the east side of the Nile River. And all the pyramids, the tombs, necropolis are located on the west side of the Nile River, which is the direction of death and afterlife. The Nile River also is a river of life. Without the Nile River, there wouldn't be Egypt. There wouldn't be um, arable land in Egypt because it is surrounded by desert. The Nile River has an annual flooding. Um, spring rain brought those water from the Ethiopian highland and uh, flood the area turning the river valley into a long, large lake. And um, 
that any uh, inundation, any flooding is uh, beneficial. It's not a life destroying flood. It is a life giving flood because after the water retreat, it left a thick, fertile, black, um, black silt. And that are um, that very narrow floating arable land um, float on top of the desert and those produce all the food the Egyptians need, support life, both human life and wildlife. And just that kind of very narrow arable land pr produce plenty of food, not only enough for the Egyptians, but also to supply food to neighboring countries. As late as the Roman Empire time, when Egypt became a province of the Roman Empire, Egypt was still the granary of the Roman Empire. It produced food, not only for the Egyptians, but also to supply, supply other part of the Roman um, Empire. So it's that kind of a, a country. Um, Nile River significance is really um, can't be exaggerated to the ancient Egyptians. Um, this made a huge contrast to another great river, say the Great River, uh, the Yellow River of China. And we will come back to the Yellow River to see how Yellow River define the history of China. Yellow River is very different from Nile River. It's also life-giving but it is also life destroying. The flood of Yellow River destroys cities and destroy uh, dynasties. While the flooding of Nile River was controllable, it's predictable. And uh, uh, without the flooding of Nile River, there wouldn't be arable land at all. So I think first we need to understand the significance of the river to the Egyptian civilization before we start looking at their architecture. The arable land left by the Nile River flooding was so precious that the ancient Egyptians measured every inch of this uh, fertile silt. They divided them into grid and um, carefully maintain this uh, fertile soil. And uh, in doing so, they invented geometry. Geometry, which is um, a Greek word, is composed of two parts, geo and metri. Geo means earth and metri means measure. So geometry started with the measuring of land and that began in Egypt. In Egypt, but the careful measuring, dividing, maintaining of this fertile land um, was the backbone for the entire Egyptian art and, and architecture. So we see, we will see in Egyptian architecture, geometry really played a huge part. Geometry coming from agriculture control of land um, also had impact in Egyptian uh, painting for example, Egyptian painting were created in the similar fashion, uh, dividing the surface into small grid of squares and uh, the human figures were measured that way um, and controlled in proportion and in their presence, pretty much um, in the same way um, they control the fertile land of the Nile River Valley. So, um, <clears throat> Egyptian monumental architecture survived because the Egyptians were predominantly concerned about the li life after, after Earth, after this, this life. So all those monumental architecture survived today, the pyramids um, of the Old Kingdom and the um, temples of the New Kingdom, for example, were primarily product to serve the afterlife. And um, 
Um, I also mentioned that the Nile provide a model for thinking about life and the death. It defined the direction east and west associated with life and the death. And the Nile River parallel to the Milky Way in sky somehow made a metaphor um, as if one you know, crossed the river to go to the next life, to go to the life after, after death. Um, so their graves, graves are on the western bank of the Nile River. And so that physically the body needs to, um, the mummified body needs to cross the river to reach the west to be um, inter, entering the eternal home for afterlife. So Egyptian culture had a huge emphasis on serving the next life to some extent. Um, life on earth, one of the primary concern is to have a proper prepar uh, preparation for, for death. Um, they spend large wealth preparing their tomb, um, not invested on the living house, but the wealth was mostly invested to prepare the tomb. And that's why you know, we have such a rich kind of material culture um, to still uh, directly, you know, 5,000 years um, after they were created. The Egyptians believe in kind of complicated procedure one need to go through in order to, to preserve the body for eternity. They believe that the soul, known as Ka, travels on a boat to the afterlife. To get there and reach eternal life, one must carefully follow elaborate rituals. And these details to prepare body and soul for life, for eternal life after death, are recorded in the Book of Death. You know, the Book of Death is not like one book talking about a general death. It is many books that were um, tailored for each individual. Um, of course, those individuals are powerful and rich person who can afford um, this kind of elaborate ritual burial. And uh, in their sarcophagus, there is usually um, a book of death. And that book of death is meant to facilitate this specific individual to pass after the test of those gods and the goddesses to enter eternal life. And in those books, um, books of death, um, great detail are offered about how the body were mummified, how the intestines, internal organs were separated and cleaned to be put in small jars to be buried separately, the protection of the heart, um, you know, after a mummified and the body put into the, um, the case, the coffin, um, et cetera, and et cetera. And there were also those scrolls um, painted on papyrus um, paper um, known as the Book of Death, uh, detailing those procedures. So in one word, prepare, pre preparing for death is a major concern for e ancient Egyptian life and helped to produce the eternal architecture survived today, including the pyramid. Egyptian civilization comparable in length and um, grander to the ancient Mesopotamia started um, around 3000 BCE. Um, <clears throat> but before that, Egypt was not a unified country. There were smaller regimes and um, around 2700 BCE, there was, before that, there was an upper Egypt, there was a lower Egypt. The upper Egypt referred to the southern part, the upper reach of the river, and which features this kind of linear Nile. The lower Egypt referred to the Delta, Nile Delta, where the Nile River split into a fan shape, 
um, to join Mediterranean Sea. It also includes a large oasis known as the, uh, the Fayum Oasis, uh, which is this one. So these are like Lower Egypt and Upper Egypt. Before the unification, there, was, there were two major kingdoms and uh, featuring different architectural style and featuring different rulership and their kings wear different hats. This is the hat, the crown of the Upper Egypt. This is the hat of the Lower Egypt. But after unification, the two hats were put together. So you put a Upper Egypt hat on top of the Lower Egypt hat. This kind of a bowling shape, bowling ball um, shaped kind of bottle. Um, it creates kind of this kind of joint. Um, hat. That unification um, was significant and it is also demonstrated in architecture. Architecture was used to showcase to maintain this unification um, in the old kingdom. So Egyptian history, following Egyptian history, was divided into an old kingdom, a middle kingdom, and a new kingdom. So that's pretty much what we are going to look at these three unified uh, period, Old Kingdom from around 2700 BCE to 2190 BCE, um, and the Middle Kingdom from about uh, 2040 to 1674 BCE, and the New Kingdom from 1552 BCE to 1069 BCE. And uh, in between, there are the so-called intermediate period. Those intermediate period, during those intermediate period, Egypt was either in split or being under the control of other uh, neighboring empires. Um, and during those intermediate period, the country was uh, not powerful enough to accomplish those monumental um, architecture like those unified old kingdom for the construction of pyramid and the new kingdom, unified new kingdom for the construction of Amon temple. Amon um, is the sun god in Egyptian mythology, right? So the su supreme god in Egyptian civilization was the god of the sun, while in Mesopotamia it was the god of the moon. Um, and um, the uh, supreme symbol for Islam which was born in the land of the Middle East, still feature that kind of crescent, the moon symbol. While in Egypt, it was the sun god that was the supreme god. In the New Kingdom period, their kings, their pharaoh, would identify themselves with, with Amon. Um, so that's the period we are going to look at. Um, in the fourth century, Egypt was conquered by the Greek Empire or the Alexander, Alexander's Empire, the uh, Marchidonian Empire. So it became a province, pretty much a province of the Alexander's um, Empire, later became independent and became known as Ptolemaic um, Egypt. Uh, that's kind of a, a Hellenistic Egypt, which we are not going to, to look at in this lecture. And then after the first century, Egypt was conquered. Um, the Ptolemaic Egypt was conquered by Caesar Augustus and it became a Roman province. Um, and after that, it will remain in the Roman Sophia. And then um, in the um, seventh century, it was conquered by the Arabs um, and it became a um, province of the Arabic Islamic Empire. Um, so those are um, those those architectural um, examples belong to following lectures. So today we are going to focus on basically the old kingdom and the new kingdom. For the new, old kingdom, we will look at pyramid basically, and for the new kingdom, we will focus on the uh, temple, uh, especially the temple dedicated to the sun god Amon. I mentioned the significance of Egypt, the unification, the significance 
of that unification. That was documented in a plate uh, showing the conquest of the lower Egypt by the upper Egypt king of Nama or Menes. So depending on the different interpretation of the uh, Egyptian hieroglyph, um, the king is either known as Menes or Nama. So he is shown on this plate um, executing a captive. Um, so the unification was not without violence, obviously. And um, those beheaded um, captives lying on the ground showing on the other side. So this is interpreted as the, um, the first artifact showing a, a unified Egypt. But as late as the um, fifth dynasty in Old Kingdom, the theme of unification of North and South was still a predominant um, predominant motif to feature in, um, in their monumental architecture. So we will observe this in King Joseph's funeral complex at Saqqara. Completed um, around 2689 BCE. So this is a necropolis. Um, this is a city for the dead. This is also the very first standing pyramid from Egypt. You know, pyramid is such a paramount symbol of ancient Egypt, Egyptian civilization. Uh, Joseph's pyramid is the beginning of a um, kind of a construction uh, idiom for ancient uh, Egypt. The structure symbolized the eternal power of the king as the sole ruler of upper and lower Egypt. The funeral complex was constructed like a city with its own walls that is oriented pretty much parallel to the Nile River, all right? So if we take this plan as the plan of the Joseph complex at Saqqara, the Nile River is flowing you know, in this direction, right? From south to north in this direction. I can't draw it outside of the slide, but it's kind of a, in this direction. That's the Nile River's direction. That's north, right? So it's basically oriented north-south. Um, the main entrance is on the southeast corner, right here. This is the entrance to the complex. Located in the center is the pyramid. It's a stepped pyramid. The stepped pyramid um, has six uh, steps, six uh, steps uh, piled up one on top of the other creating a pyramidal shape. But if you disregard the number of layers, it is pretty much built with the same concept of the uh, Mesopotamian ziggurat, right? The Mesopotamian ziggurat is usually three layers and uh, featuring three exterior layers, even though the inside might be, you know, many, many layers um, due to the periodical expansion and reconstruction. But conceptually, they are very similar. But the way they are constructed is very different because here it's all stone blocks. And, um, um, and it's the, the construction procedure is also slightly different, which we will, we will see later. So that's in the, in the, in the middle, in, located in the middle is the, um, the pyramid. Located in the south, these are the temples, the shrines to bury the uh, internal organ. Right? So the convention is to separate the internal organ from the body. The body is mummified, but the internal organ, the heart, the liver, the lung, 
are put in separate jars and those were enshrined um, separately. So these, these shrines are for the uh, internal organ known as the third up um, tomb. Right? This is a pyramid, presumably to bury the mummified body, the shell, and this is the internal part. And then on the east side, there's a series of buildings and these buildings are dummies. These are not real buildings. Like the pyramid, they are solid. There's no interior space except, you know, very few of them. It is basically huge piles of stone, but they were dressed as if they were architecture. So from this model, you can see they looks like huge halls, but there is no interior. They are just solid, um, all stone piles. Um, but the features facade and uh, having those doors carved on the surface as if you can enter. Um, this is basically a huge model, life-size model of an Egyptian palace, but carved into solid stone, uh, built with solid stone block. So that's basically the uh, funeral complex, what it is. Why did they you know, spend such energy, material, labor to construct a dummy model for palace and for tomb? And that is, of course, because they believe eternal life after, li after you know, this life, after death. And they believe that you need those physical um, structure to support, to match the great life of the pharaohs. Um, the entrance features the largest interior space. All the others are dummy, solid buildings, solid uh, core buildings. The only real interior, large scale interior is this corridor. So this corridor is the single entrance to the complex. Um, it has 40 columns framing it here, 40, 40 columns, a reference to the administrative division of Egypt after unification. So um, the theme of unification is expressed here in the number of columns. Um, and um, um, its axis also symbolize the flow of Nile. It was made of stone. And here, the columns were created in, in separate drums. So this is very different from the uh, Mesopotamian, uh, from the Persian monolithic columns. Here, uh, the column was divided into drums um, and uh, combined with other brick size, you know, stone, stone blocks. And surrounding the walls, um, there are dummy doors as if you can enter, but in fact, there was nothing, no space to enter. These are just an illusion, right? Um, the whole thing is like that. Um, the, all the great facade behind them are you know, just endless layers of stone. This is a reconstruction drawing of that entrance column the only real large scale in, uh, interior space under roof. The columns are shaped um, as if they were bundles of, of plants, right? These were all, car all carved on the, on the stone. You can see the division of this column stone are the same on the same level of those, those stones constructing the wall. In fact, these are not real columns. They only create, a, create an illusion of column. They are just a decorative part of the, of the wall, sticking out from the, um, from the side of these dumb, dummy buildings. But the end of the wall is shaped into a column form as if they have a base and uh, the form of the column is mimicking uh, reed construction. The roof 
um, also mimic log construction. So this is the stone architecture, but the image of the stone surface is mimicking timber plant construction. The only explanation is in real life on the east side of Nile River, the real palace for the king were constructed in wood, all right, like that. So they mimic that them in permanent material of stone. None of those real palaces for the living king had survived, probably because they were all constructed in temporary material like the reed and the wood uh, that these stone architecture is mimicking. So this strongly supported the hypothesis that Egyptians put greater emphasis on life after death while considering the life on, on earth temporary and to be sheltered in temporary material while the tomb were to be sheltered in those permanent material. Right, so um, a huge court is in front of the, um, um, the stepped pyramid from the south. And um, on the east side, there is a space known as the, um, the Hapsad court. The Hapsad court was in the living quarter on east bank, was meant to be a ceremony space for the Hapsad festival. Hapsad festival was to test the virid virid virility of the uh, king. So a king before enthronement, he needed to be engaged in a ceremonial race, a chariot race, and uh, to prove that he had the power and strength to rule the country. And if a king or a pharaoh in Egyptian, um, in the Egyptian term, the pharaoh ruled over 20 years, you know, after that he needed to perform this Hapsad festival to prove his virility, virility um, uh, every few years. It's like, you know, in the US after 70, you need to, to be tested and reissued your driver license every year, right? So the Egyptian pharaoh uh, need to go through that. So the real ceremony happened on the East Bank in the real city, but for the funeral complex, it was constructed there, even though it might never be used for that purposes because there's no real temple there at all. But uh, somehow they believe they need the similar kind of uh, crucial space um, for afterlife. And so they were replicated there. And images for that Hapsat festival um, were carved on the wall. So um, the court is framed by temples, dummy temples. And these temples uh, shows different roof style. And these different roof styles were um, meant to represent the architectural style of Upper and Lower Egypt, uh, respectively. So the curved rooftop is an architectural style of the, um, of the Lower Egypt, while the straight line are the Upper Egypt um, architectural style. And they were copied in stone here at Saqqara. Um, archaeologists has reconstructed based on these stone Image, images um, the what a real temple with real interior space might look like. So they were wooden construction, right? And again, those in the Old Kingdom period, uh, those real temples for, for life um, were destroyed while those dummies replica were preserved. So these were temple um, and these temples were meant to uh, be witness to the testing of the um, enthroning pharaohs. So the incorporation of different styles, different regional styles um, uh, indicate the 
um, theme of unification in the construction of Old Kingdom monument. So not only roof style, but also architectural decoration utilize different capitals to symbolize upper and lower Egypt. For example, the red palace and the, um, the white palace, um, they were uh, representing um, the red um, kingdom, uh, red, uh, red lotus, um, capital of Upper Egypt and the white papyrus capital of the uh, Lower Egypt. So in the decoration of the column, uh, different uh, column styles were also used to uh, show that the ruler was the, um, uh, the lord of both North and South. Um, the unification of architectural style symbolized the unification of kind of political uh, regimes. Um, this is the, uh, de a detail of the third up um, tombs where the internal organs are enshrined. And the architectural decoration again shows the, um, uh, the detail of plant architecture, you know, architecture with temporary material. It shows the road matrix um, above the false door, as if you know these were entering interable spaces, um, but of course these are all just um, creating a illusion of real architecture. But the very reason they made these images um, allow us to reconstruct the real timber architecture that was standing on the Egyptian Egyptian soil. Another major, another interior space. So the majority are dummies, but there are interior space here, small interior space here, and also small interiors here. Um, this interior space is the, um, the temple, um, offering temple or sacrificial temple for the king. While the body of the king was buried under the pyramid, the sculpture of Jaza is uh, installed in this, um, in this temple, attached to the north slope of the pyramid, right? He is shown there sitting with all the kind of uh, in the, the royal um, headdress and beard, uh, looking through a hole as if he is observing those sacrifice made to his, to his afterlife. Um, so this, these are called the, the, the mortuary temples, which are adjacent to the pyramid. The Egyptian, the stepped pyramid was developed from the uh, simple Egyptian mastaba tombs. Uh, before Jaza, Egyptian kings were buried under mastaba tombs. And after Jaza, common folks and also those lower um, uh, aristocratic family members were still being buried under mastaba tombs. The mastaba tomb is basically a, a, a square shape uh, platform in which above ground there is a temple and in the temple there is a statue and underground there is a tomb chamber with a shaft connected to the top allowing air to enter, and that is the place for the sarcophagus and the mummified body. So the idea of the, the stepped pyramid is basically to put one mastaba on top of the other and create a pyramidal shape and made the mortuary temple, instead of inside the pyramid, it is attached to the north slope and then the burial chamber is still inside, right? Um, sometimes underground, sometimes just within those huge pile of stone. So to some extent, the stepped pyramid of Jaza at Saqqara is just um, a piling up of those mustabas, one on top of the other to create this pyramid. However, 
you know, more careful observation into the way it is constructed shows it is not a simple um, stepping of one on top of the other. The way it is constructed is very different from the way the um, Mesopotamian ziggurat is constructed. The pyramid, the way pyramid is, is constructed is from the center to the, to the outer layers. So um, at Saqqara, first, a mastaba is constructed based on archaeological um, testing. So first, it seems like it started with a simple mastaba. But then <clears throat> um, more layers were put in the core. And uh, it also expand by putting surrounding layers around it to create that stepped appearance. So in another word, it is not like completing the lower platform entirely and then start constructing the upper layer. No, it's not constructed that way. It starts from the bottom, but also from the center. And then continue the center and expanding and then continue and then expanding. Um, so probably it was meant to be um, a, a four-story pyramid, but somehow the king lived longer and decided to put another two more layer. So it seems that it, it was completed like that first but eventually another two steps were added by expanding, shifting the core to the side and put more layers to match the height of the other side. So it's a complicated process um, for the construction. Why is that? Um, well, the explanation might be quite simple. You know, a pharaoh start constructing their tomb as soon as they became the king. And uh, they start with something that is more uh, moderate. But if that moderate, smaller size pyramid is completed, and they still are healthy and can continue to live, they will expand it until they die. So basically, the longer a pharaoh rule, the bigger their pyramid. And this is something we will observe in the future construction of pyramid as well. There are bigger ones, there are smaller ones. Those bigger ones are usually belong to the pharaoh who ruled for you know, 30 years, 40 years. Um, and those smaller ones belong to those pharaohs who ruled only for a decade or something, uh, basically. So this, this again proved that um, Egyptians, the preparation for afterlife was a lifelong task. It's the main concern when they are living. And for a pharaoh, when as long as they are ruling, they continue the construction of their eternal life after death. So let's stop here today and we will pick up um, next time and um, finish Egyptian architecture and continue to look at uh, the Greek world.